right. So this morning we began looking at the post-pandemic church, really doing an analysis of some things that we learned. And so we began by uh, introducing the principle that difficult times don't necessarily make people as much as they reveal who they are. Uh, it kind of brings out what's already there, pushes it to the surface. And, uh, but it has a way of building strength and endurance. And so with that premise, <clears throat> we're looking at, uh, and we looked this morning at the positive things that came uh, from the pandemic, or at least three of them anyway. We're just looking at three under each one of these. A lot of other things could have been said. And uh, where we pick up tonight is we're looking at, um, well, I forget I'm trying to catch up in PowerPoint here. Uh, <clears throat> we looked at sacrificial service, generosity, uh, and endurance this morning as some of those positive things and some of the details that were involved in that. And uh, now we're picking up where we uh, may need to pay attention and, and make some progress. And uh, I don't know that anybody is really excluded uh, from these uh, particular things that we're going to talk about. And so this, uh, the last one we talked about was no substitute for worship community and how I think everybody really felt the challenge of coming out of being able to kind of worship at our own convenience at home for a while and then to face the challenge to get up and get going again and um, so I think if we're honest we all kind of felt that and so um, that's something we have to work through <clears throat> and so tonight I want us to pick up with the second area and that has to do with Christian character Christian character the Bible has a lot to say about our character and about how we behave and about how we treat other people and um, so before we get into this before we launch into this and the next point uh, tonight we can just go ahead and everybody admit that we've all made mistakes in these areas we've all blown it in these areas there's really nobody exempt from that and so if, if we can all admit that on the front end it makes the analysis a whole lot easier uh, because we're not trying to pretend that we were perfect and uh, it just kind of opens us up to be able to to see these things now <clears throat> I say that when we talk about Christian character a lot of times especially in Paul's writings when you think about Ephesians and Colossians in particular he will talk about the importance of putting off the old man and putting on the new man and putting off the old man with sinful behaviors and putting on the new man created in the image of God in true righteousness and holiness. And we'll talk about characteristics that then should describe us. Or you could look at Galatians 5, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. Okay, And <clears throat> it's very easy for us to, to kind of l rattle off the fruit of the spirit um, because many of us probably learned it as kids, a, a child song that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But it's another thing to actually feel the gravity of those things and to actually believe them so much we live them, okay? Um, and that comes down even into the nitty-gritty of everyday life of, of how we treat people in every one of our relationships. And so... <clears throat> I want us to just look at some areas to where you can, you can pay attention, not just on a local level, but at churches really all over the place. And honestly, if you had social media, it really wasn't hard to see some of these things. Uh, the debates that raged amongst Christians concerning how things should be handled uh, in the midst of difficulties and um, that some of these things were obviously violated and uh, <clears throat> some of the others you know even though we may not have a social media account you can still violate things without being on social media so let's begin by looking at at some of these areas to pay attention to number one is the idea of a temper losing our temper you know um, <clears throat> losing our temper is not just uh, with a lot of these characteristics we almost treat them like we're passive participants you know, that's just kind of how I am. And when I lose control, I lose control. Fair enough. Everybody has, I think probably everybody at some point in their lives battles with their temper. But we've got to stop making excuses for losing our temper. Okay? 
That can't happen. And that's not, it's not, um, with these things, we cannot use the excuse that says, that's just how I am. Because God has said, that's not how we are to be. And if you were to go in, and you know, I'm, I'm not a medical person at all, but I have an idea that if you were to look at, the, at our DNA code, I'm probably sure you wouldn't find that one person has a bigger temper strain than other people. Okay? And so it's something that's wholly under our control. And we have to remember that the Bible still reads this way in Ephesians 4 and verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger. That's not a redundant use of terms, wrath and anger. Wrath is a, is a deep-seated. Um, you know, some people harbor a lot of anger toward things. And some of that anger is justified and some of that anger is unjustified. Um, but you have anger and then you have, or wrath, and then you have anger. Or as some translations would render it, uh, it would render the original term thumos, which is the idea of a flash of anger, your temper. And so what does he say concerning these things? Let all, all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, clamor would be loud quarreling or yelling matches where we're yelling at one another. That that is the idea of clamor and slander, speaking evil of one another. He says, let those things be put away from you. That is, if we're Christians, these are things we don't make excuses for. These are things that are not supposed to characterize us, where we fly off the handle and we let people have it. And it doesn't matter what the circumstances are, and it doesn't matter what we try and do to justify them. It's wrong. It's wrong. And... We got to, we've got to learn to call it like it is because I've seen people who have grown into older age and they're still flying off the handle at people and they're doing it by saying, you know, that's, that's just kind of how I am. But the reason why I believe some of those people are still that way is because people said that's just how they are. It's just, it's just who they are. No, it's not. It's a sinful behavior that they've chosen to embrace. And nobody has ever had the guts to tell them that what you're doing isn't right. You don't get the right to walk all over people with your words and to have outbursts of anger on them because they do something that you don't like. That's not Christian. And so in the area of temper, we've got to pay attention to that. And very close to that, another area that, that came to the forefront was impatience. We can be impatient people, especially as Americans. We, we like things to happen immediately. We, ha we have a microwave because we want it to happen immediately. Uh, um, if our cell phone doesn't charge as fast as we'd like it to, well, we'll just get a different one. And so <clears throat> we have to watch being impatient and having our tempo because those two things really go along with one another. Now, a third area would be hurtful speech. Hurtful speech. Solomon said in Proverbs 18 and verse 21, death and life are both in the power of the tongue. You can either use your life to destroy and to kill, or you can use your tongue for life, to build up relationships and to build up other people. And then you think about Ephesians 4 and verse 29 in this same context, when he says this, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So knowing what to say and when to say it. <laughs> I don't remember exactly where I first came across this, but I'm pretty sure I was in high school and some friends of uh, a couple of buddies of mine, we were sitting around talking about something, and I think one of them brought it up. But... Um, <clears throat> It's proved to be some of the most helpful advice I've ever heard in my life. Never miss a good opportunity to shut up. Never miss a good opportunity to shut up. To just close our mouths. And, and just let it go. Because here's the thing. You and I both know this, 
that words, once they're, once they're spoken, they can be, we can repent of them and we can receive forgiveness from the other person, but you can't ever take them back. You can't haul a net out there and catch them and bring them back before the other person hears them. And what he's saying here is we need to not only know how to speak and how to say the right things, but how to say the right things in the right moments that fit the proper occasion, that it may minister grace to the hearers, to use our words to build up. And the same thing could be said in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Let our, see, let our speech be always uh, seasoned with salt or grace that we may know how we ought to answer each person. And so we have to pay very close attention to the way that we use our tongues, okay? And uh, none of us are exempt from that. None of us are exempt from that. But it's something we need to pay attention to. Think about how we're using our words. Another area would be the area of complaining. You know, we look at complaining, and of course there's a difference between some of our complaints where we're joking along and doing things along that line. It's not what... But a deep-seated complaint is the idea of being discontent with what God has done. And that's why in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, he says, Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Do all things without grumbling. This is a, the word that's... Tra the original word here is one of those funny words. It's called an onomatopoeia. And an onomatopoeia is where the sound actually stands for the word. That's, that's the, and so the idea behind the word grumbling is it's just grumbling under your breath and complaining about everything under the sun. Now, I want you to think about how seriously God takes this because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when he's dealing with and talking about the sins of Israel in the wilderness, look, he says in verse 6, do not desire evil. Verse 7, do not be idolaters. Verse 8, do not, uh, must not indulge in sexual immorality. Uh, verse 9, must not put Christ to the test. Verse 10, nor grumble. I want you to think about where he took grumbling and what he sandwiched it with. He put it with things that you and I look at and think, well, that's, that's kind of a big deal. That's right. It is a big deal. And <clears throat> if any of us are honest, how many of us have ever complained ourselves into a better situation or a better mood? Now, some kids have because sometimes as parents, we'd rather give them what they want and tell them to be quiet than actually doing what's best for them. And unfortunately, that has continued on into adulthood. We have adults who are still about as mature as they were when it comes to this than they were when they were kids. If they complain long enough, people will give it to them just to make, just to make them be quiet. And they're so used to that, they lose their minds. They cannot understand why another adult won't cave to them like every other person in their life has caved to them. You see, <clears throat> and this goes down a road... <laughs> Randy Bowerman and I were in deep theo theological discussion Friday on the lake about some of this. Um, we have to have a realistic view of our kids. Every parent loves their child. But the parents who hold their children up as perfect and as the standard of what children should be are not doing their children any favors. My children are not perfect. My children, I don't want them growing up with the idea that no one has the right to challenge them about their behavior. Because they do have the right to challenge them about their behavior when their behavior is wrong. And I want people to challenge them about their behavior when it's wrong. But what happens is we grow up and we create this, this bubble around our kids. And when they become adults, because nobody has ever pushed back at them at any point in their life, they don't know how to respond when other people who come to them and say, you know what, what you're doing is not right. What do you mean it's not right? It's not right. 
you're, you're, just, you're just being, I mean, I, I act like this my whole life. My parents never got on to me about this kind of stuff. So? It doesn't change the difference between right and wrong. And a lot of problems that we have to deal with is deprogramming and tearing out behaviors that sometimes we as parents built into our children without realizing that's what we were building into them. And this has to do with one of those things that you can complain and get what you want. You can say hurtful things and I'm not going to hold you accountable for it. I don't ever make you go and apologize to people that you hurt with your words. All we're doing is setting them up to be giant bullies when they get older. That's all we're doing. And they're going to have a hard time when they come to the New Testament and God starts calling their hand on things. Furthermore, another area, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7, dangerously assuming things about people. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It believes all things. It believes what is best in people. We don't tend to do that. We don't tend to do that. This is the way a lot of people tend to operate. Keith walked by me this morning. Let's say, hypothetically, I don't, I don't think this happened. It might have. Who knows? I'm obviously not torn up about it. But he, he walked by me this morning, and he didn't speak to me. Now, it could be that he had 8,000 other things on his mind and had something that he needed to be doing. Or, and by the way, that's the logical way to think through things if somebody walks by and they're not speaking to you. Or I could say, you know what, he never really does talk to me. And he's an elder and he's supposed to care about people. And it's not long until we're way out into the world of irrational that is so far detached from reality. Love does not operate. If I, if I do that to people, I am not a loving person. That's what the Bible says. If I treat people that way, I am not a loving person. I'm assuming you've got some kind of personal vendetta against me, and you know what? That makes it okay for me to be unkind to you and for me to be ugly to you. But the Bible says that love believes all things. I believe that you would never do anything to intentionally hurt me, even if what you did did hurt me. I would never, I would doubt my interpretation of your behavior before I would doubt your behavior. Do we get that? I would doubt my interpretation of your behavior before I would doubt your behavior. I would question that I was misunderstanding your silence before I would ever accuse you of treating me in an unloving way. That's the way love operates. It gets the chip off of its shoulder. Not everybody in the world is out to get us. And furthermore, sometimes, this is strong, but it's the only way I know how to say it, we need to get over ourselves. People have lives that function beyond the realm of us. And preachers are some of the worst at this. Well, nobody ever pats me on the head. Nobody ever tells me I did a good job. They have lives they're trying to live. They can't spend their whole life patting you on the head. And furthermore, how, how much maturity are you displaying and how mature are you if you constantly need somebody's affirmation patting you on the head? Love is willing to believe what is best in people before it ever doubts them. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. It does not insist on its own way. Self-willed. 
does anyone tonight believe something that they do not believe is right? Do you believe something tonight that you do not believe is right? I don't. What I believe, I believe it because I think it's right. But does that make me right all the time? Absolutely not. And does that mean that I should force my will on you because I believe it's right? Or get mad at you because you don't do what I want you to do. Think about what I'm saying. I get mad at you because you don't do what I want you to do. Who, what am I setting myself up as? I'm setting myself in the place of God. That I know exactly everything that's going on and exactly how a situation should be handled. And you should do it. End of story. It is the height of arrogance. It's the very epitome of arrogance. It's unloving to insist on my own way. Furthermore, the first phrase of 1 Corinthians 13, 5 in describing love says that it is not rude. It is not graceless in the way that it treats people. You know, sometimes we're just rough and gruff with people. We're just rough and gruff with people. But that's not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be gentle with people. To be kind with our words. And so rudeness or gracelessness or a harshness toward people And listen, there are, some, there are people who legitimately struggle with this. Um, I have a friend who is in cybersecurity for a Fortune 500 company. To make his living, he has to think in what terms? Defensive negative terms. He has to scheme all the ways that people would come in the back door. He has to scheme and he has to think about ways and he has to assume the worst in people who are trying to operate on his network and things along those lines and because he deals with so many people who are breaking the rules he will tell you himself that he struggles to remember that not everybody is like that and I can't be rough with everybody the way that I am in other situations And what we have to understand about this is <clears throat> sometimes we get the notion that as long as we believe that baptism is for the remission of sins and we don't use an instrument and we don't have female preachers, that means that we are doctrinally right before God. Listen, the same Bible that says repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins says that a Christian doesn't behave himself rudely it says that a Christian does not fly off the handle and lose their temper and lash out at people with their tongues it's the same book and it's dangerous when we start qualifying or quantifying and saying well because I believe this that makes me okay I can I can mistreat people this not only describes how we interact with each other but how we interact with people period how do you interact with a, with a rude waiter or waitress How do you interact with them? People say, but they're being unkind. But Jesus does not, <laughs> Jesus does not care. 
people were unkind to him. And he never, 1 Peter 2, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten. He committed himself to him who judges righteously. Like the old basketball coach in a movie had to tell his players, he got tired of them running their mouths on the court to the opposing team and humiliating them. And the players came back to him and said, but coach, they were jawing at us first. He said, what's wrong with you? You can't show class. He said, since when is it not enough to defeat your opponent? Why do you have to humiliate them in the process? He understood something. And that's what we have to understand. This is what, and if it were easy, everybody would do it. But it's not. It's what Christ calls us to do. So, <clears throat> Those are Christian character issues that all of us have to watch on, keep a guard on ourselves, handle those situations. The last one to think about is the idea of reconciliation. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to begin, and then we will expand this out into a number of different areas. We're actually going to begin back in verse 16. It says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. That is, Christ is no longer with us on the earth. That's not how we uh, know him. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Now pause there because there's the first thing we have to understand when we talk about reconciliation. The church exists because of what? Our very existence is based on what? Reconciliation. We were at enmity with God. Jesus stepped in as the mediator, paid the price, brought the two parties back together. We exist because God reconciled us. Okay? Now, continue on in verse 18. <clears throat> and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ... God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, entrusting to us the ministry of the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what this says is, we were reconciled and then we were given as our assignment in ministry to help other people be reconciled to God. We're about healing broken relationships. That's what we're about. Okay, so let's take this and let's, let's expand it in two areas. Number one. What about people who have gone astray? in the midst of the pandemic. The people whose faith has evaporated in the midst of this. So Galatians 6 and verse 1, <clears throat> there are a lot of things there, but um, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual should restore such one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. But if you'll notice the way that reads, if a, if a brother or sister is overtaken in a trespass, it doesn't mean they choose to go into it. They just kind of get caught up in everyday life and it just kind of slowly creeps in and overtakes them. Okay? So let's think about this. I think the pandemic is a perfect illustration of this. So, Sundays we couldn't worship together. We couldn't come together. So we had to do something to fill our time slots. We're going to do something with our time. And so people chose to, to engage in activities. There was nothing wrong with those activities. 
There is nothing sinful about those activities. But somewhere along the way, those activities became the priority. And God became secondary. And when it was time to come back and be who we were supposed to be in our worship settings, we had gotten so used to doing this, we chose this instead of God. That's a brother or sister who's overtaken in a trespass. They didn't do it intentionally saying, I'm going to walk away from Christ, but they did. They allowed something to come in and to trump and take first place, and they drifted away from God. Hebrews 2 and verse 1. So, as a ministry of reconciliation, then, we have it as our job to encourage those who have gone astray. Who are not doing things the way that they should. Now, that encouragement has to be done the right way. All right, now, based upon that, there's a second area we need to think about. And that is how we work through our differences together. I'll be the first one to tell you I used to find every reason under the sun to avoid having car hard conversations with people. I didn't want to have them. Who in their right mind likes those things? But God taught me a lesson the hard way. that you've got to have the guts to do the right thing. You've got to have the guts to do the right thing. And at some point in our time together, I may be able to talk about the experience that forced me into that, but at this point in my life, I'm not able to talk about it. Because, unfortunately, there still has not been reconciliation in that area. I hope that there can be, but there hasn't been yet. So when people are involved, you can expect conflict to happen, right? You got two people, they're imperfect, conflict expected. You have it in your marriage, you have it with your children. You have it in your workplace. We all have it. The church will not be exempt of that. And the first thing that's going to help us is to realize. Because we want to pull the religion card and say, well, you're not supposed to be like this. That's right. But we're all a work in progress. And we're going to have differences. But what defines who we become is how we handle them. The same way how you handle conflict in your marriage defines the direction of your marriage or the way you handle conflict with your kids defines the direction of your relationship with them. The same thing is true in the church. The way we handle it defines the direction that we take. We either become fractured or we actually draw closer. What most people do not realize about conflict, they avoid it, what most people do not realize about conflict is that true intimacy, true closeness is found on the other side of conflict. Superficial relationships do not have conflict. They're not worth having. They're superficial. They're not legitimate. You find anybody who has a strong marriage, and I will show you people who know how to disagree with one another and work it out. I think I've told you this story, but there was a business leader who was lecturing on this, and he said that his college roommate married his sister-in-law. And after about two years, they got divorced, and nobody knew what happened. One day he sat down with him. His name is Patrick, and he said, he said Pat, this is what happened. He said, I used to think you and your wife had a terrible marriage because you fought all the time. 
He said, what I came to realize was we had a terrible marriage because we could not stop. We could not disagree. And they didn't make it. And marriages that don't know how to do that will not make it. That or they might continue to stay together, but it won't be any good. So, working through differences. Jesus lays out a model. Now, I'm going to grant to you in Matthew 18, the model that he lays out has to do with church discipline. It has to do with the sin of one person against another. But sometimes our disagreements aren't about sin, right? Our disagreements aren't about sin. And we have to be able to know the difference. So in the pandemic, the most obvious disagreement, and it was everywhere. It was everywhere. Was concerning a face mask. Now, what's one thing we can say for certain based on Scripture about face masks? There's nothing sinful about wearing them or not wearing them. This was not a matter of sin. It's not a matter of church discipline. It's a matter of disagreement about how a situation should have been handled. That's what it was. So we have to first see it for what it was. So, as we work through our differences, Jesus lays out this model. If your brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he will hear you, you've gained your brother. Now, we've said that the model we're working with, with pandemic disagreements, on the whole, most pandemic disagreements were not about sin. They're about differences of opinion. But I do believe that what Jesus is laying out in Matthew 18 is still the right approach to handling differences. Just because sin may not be involved doesn't mean that sitting down with one another and working it out is not the right approach, because it is the right approach. So, as we work through our differences, here are some things we have to think about in reconciliation. Number one, when I'm trying to reconcile a situation according to what Scripture says, the first thing I need to do is take a deep breath and assess the situation. I need to get my feelings out of the way and get my head engaged in the game. How many of us have ever followed our feelings into good decisions? Not very many. But a lot of us who have made good decisions and found that our feelings actually followed by making a good decision when we let our heads rule. So I need to calm down and assess the situation. Number two, I need to ask myself this question. And these are all the questions. This, by the way, I developed this when I was in this situation a few years ago and I was trying to figure out what the Bible said I needed to do to solve the problem. So as again, as I said this morning, people who think that we're talking about individuals, take it somewhere else. That's not the way we operate here. Number two, consider areas where you might be at fault in this situation. This is about maturity, isn't it? If I'm going to look at a situation and I'm going to seek reconciliation, I'm going to have to admit the possibility that I might be wrong in this situation. Or maybe, if my, maybe if, if my argument is right in the situation, maybe the way I've handled myself is wrong. Have I done something that has contributed to this conflict? Number three, it is not talking about that person. It is talking to that person. It is not talking to everybody under the sun about the problem. It is talking to the person about the problem. Listen, running our mouths behind people's backs is cowardly. Anybody can do that. 
But when you have to sit down across from another person and look them in the eyes, all of a sudden, all this anger that you're coming with, it slows down a little bit because you realize you're dealing with a person. All right? But it's not enough just to talk to the person, number whatever this is. I have to talk to the person the right way. Which means this. Go to that person to listen. I'm not meeting with you to convince you that I'm right and you're wrong. That's not why I'm meeting with you. I am meeting with you because I want to understand your perspective. I want to understand where you are coming from. That's all I want to understand. Now, the way that we have to do that is we, the only way we can do that is if we are concerned with doing what is right more than us being right. The reason why this breaks down in so many circles is because people are more concerned with making their point and shoving it in a person's face than they are of actually trying to understand the person that says, I just want to do what is right. I don't care if that means that I'm in the wrong, that's fine, but I want to do the right thing. And if I can't listen to you and, and truly try to understand where you're coming from, it doesn't matter if we agree on it. What matters is that I try to get into your life and understand it. Not only do I go with them with the attitude to listen, but I go with them with the attitude and reminding myself that this is my brother or sister for whom Christ died. And John's argument in 1 John, when he talks about, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and he sent forth his son to be a propitiation for our sins, what would you expect him to say in return? Be beloved, if God so loved us, what would you expect him to say? We should love God. That's what we would expect, right? God has done this, therefore we ought to love God. That's not what he says. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. What he's saying is, is that his assessment of other people should affect the way that we treat other people. And I, whenever I deal with a human being, I am always dealing with a person that God loves. And he, someone that God loves just as much as he loves me. Which means we treat one another with dignity. And with respect. And when you've got two people coming together who love one another, not concerned about proving their point, but are concerned about coming to a solution, Things can change. When we value one another enough that my opinion on something is not worth losing you, we're in the right frame of mind. If my opinion is more important than losing you, if I'm willing to cut you loose, I'm in dangerous water. Listen, we all get this. It's essential to church work. 
It's essential to relationships, period. I hope that when we have disagreements with our spouses, we don't walk out the door and never come back. I hope that we realize the person that we pledged ourselves to in covenant is worth fighting for. I also hope that just because we have disagreements, we don't quit on each other. Guys, I'm telling you, I live with this every single day. Until this situation that I'm talking about in my past is resolved, I will live with it every day of my life, and I wish it would go away. I wish it would go away. I wish we could reconcile it, and it would be done. It is not worth it. It's not worth it. And thank God he saw us as something worth reconciling. And maybe we can find it in ourselves and our disagreements to see something worth reconciling to. And if we're willing to do this, All these other things are important, but this right here. If we're willing to do this, what this church is capable of, I don't think you even realize yet. It's been a long time since I've felt so strongly about the potential of a church As a matter of fact, the only other time I felt as strongly as I do about this one was in the first church I ever preached, where I believed the sky was the limit. Others, they had barriers, and they're still there, and until they work on them, they're just not going to get anywhere. This church, the sky is the limit, if we can learn, because we want to be busy going to have our disagreements if we can learn to get through this we can learn to function there is no telling what God will use us to do so I hope we'll think through that tonight if a person is outside of Christ it's our great joy to offer reconciliation that God offers with a penitent faith confessing Jesus to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins will be reconciled to God Excuse me. Or maybe as a New Testament Christian, we need to sit down and, and reconcile with other people. Maybe we need to sit down and maybe we want to pray together with other Christians that we might be reconciled to God and confess our sins. And, uh, or maybe that's something we'd just rather do privately. We just want to make sure that we're all in right standing with God and we're in good standing with each other. let's let it be in the past and drop it that's why we call it a post pandemic church let it go we can help you tonight we would love to do that as we stand and sing this song